Good morning and welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Joe Taylor. This morning, another in the ongoing series of programs presented by the Northwest Regional Key Program for Quality Early Learning. The program, through the Northwest Institute of Research, oversees a grant from the Office of Child Development and Early Learning at the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services and the Department of Education. The goal of the program is to improve the outcomes for young children as they prepare for school. John Poza is a community partner specialist for the program, and he's here with us throughout the series. Well, good morning, John, and who do we have on the show this morning? Well, this morning, Joe, we have Robin Carr Morse, and uh, she's talking to us from Portland, Oregon. Um, Robin is a nationally known family therapist from the Parenting Institute in Portland. The Institute provides parents with state-of-the-art developmental knowledge, skills, and support that focus on building emotionally competent children from conception through adolescence. Now, Robin's empowering message is that in order to understand the recent tide of violent behavior, we must look earlier before adolescence, before grade school, even before preschool, all the way to the cradle. And that's kind of the overlying theme that we're going to be talking about with Robin today. So welcome to the program, Robin. Thank you. It's nice to be here, John. Yeah, yeah thank you for, for being on. Um, there's so much that, that we want to cover in our interview uh, today, but um, I just wanted to first off mention um, about your book, uh, Ghosts from the Nursery, Tracing the Roots of Violence. Uh, I will tell you that um, we have a common police court judge here in the state of Pennsylvania, not too far from us. Uh, one, if not maybe others, uh, who are using your book as a resource when they have um, family court proceedings, depending upon what the particular case is about. So tell me a little bit about the book and, uh, you know, your work with that and how you got the, um, uh, the, the research for it. Well, you know, I've worked, I, you mentioned that I'm a family therapist. I've been doing this for about 35 years. My very first job was in juvenile justice, working with chronic felons who were put behind bars in a juvenile facility here in, in Oregon. This was a very long time ago. I worked then with young women who were pregnant and parenting in the high school in an alternative program and proceeded to just, and then I proceeded to be the director of parent training for our state child welfare system in all of those roles, in juvenile justice and working with young women who were pregnant and parenting very early in life uh, in child welfare, where parents were already involved in abuse or neglect with the system. There are cycles of behavior that repeat themselves. You know, if you stop and think about it, where do we, <laughs> where do we learn how to parent? We learn from being parented. And so you see cycles of behavior in families that are not taught on purpose, but modeled and experienced by children very early. We get that in this culture. What we don't get is how that works. And how it works is that the brain, sort of grand central for our central nervous system, is shaped by experience physically. It's not just psychological. It's physical. And it begins not just in the cradle, but it begins in the womb. So if you begin to look at the levels of trauma in the lives of prisoners or children, young people who are involved in already in violent behavior, or in the lives of young women who are pregnant and parenting when they're teenagers or very young, or in the lives of parents who tend to abuse or neglect their children, you see circumstances in experiences in their lives that have a profound effect on a physical organ, which is the brain. So the book, Ghost from the Nursery, is the ghost from the nursery that is referenced in the title, is prisoners, people who are now incarcerated. And it, the connection between what becomes of their lives and what has happened to them from prenatal exposure all the way in, into mid-childhood, usually. You can trace these patterns very, very early in life. What, what exactly? So it's about the brain, and it's about how that works. What exactly do you mean by early childhood trauma? 
surely we're not talking about a baby being left alone and crying for 10 minutes. What types of uh, traumatic situations could really damage a person for life? Well, first of all, uh, Joe, it's not one situation. It's generally a cluster or a series of situations, of experiences that build on each other. The example you just gave of a baby left to cry alone, if that happens inside with a baby who is already vulnerable because of exposure to drugs or alcohol or uh, mommy being miserable in her life, maybe fighting, having violence with her partner. Um, and so the baby is actually born traumatized, born with a little brain that's already hypervigilant, and then goes home with a mom who isn't really available because she's depressed or she is being uh, abused herself or is using drugs or is just miserable in her life. Uh, you have one equation with that crying baby. If it happens you know, once in a while for any child, of course it's not an issue. But if it happens cumulatively along with other forms of exposure to trauma, it can be true that leaving a baby alone for long periods of time to cry it out over and over and over again without the complement of the, of the balancing, uh, loving arms and soothing and holding and gentling of that little nervous system uh, can be traumatizing. But we really, we really are just beginning to understand some of the things that are traumatizing to a brand new raw little nervous system, a newborn, and that includes, you know, uh, compromised uh, birthing situations, a child who has a complicated birth, being born prematurely, going home with a depressed mom because a depressed mommy uh, is not available to a baby to resonate with them, to respond to them in the way that a person who's not depressed is. That we, one of the things we realized in researching the book is that uh, chronic maternal depression can be as hard on that little brain as abuse. Um, having multiple caregivers that the baby's not connected to, so big breaks in connection to one caregiver early, uh, random child care that is done by people who... Uh, maybe well-intentioned, but don't really see that baby as having hung the moon, whichever baby needs to be to be regarded as having hung the moon, being being really adored. Uh, that envelope of love is highly protective against trauma. Those are the kinds of things. Being separated from a parent because of chronic hospitalization, being born with a situation that causes chronic pain, uh, being born prematurely, as I mentioned earlier, all of the, any one of these things is not the issue. Premature babies can go home with a loving family and be perfectly normal. It's the equation of the balance between traumatic events and nurturing, loving events in the baby's life. Obviously, you know, the million-dollar question is, um, you know, with violence in our society today, and um, the impact on trauma and, and the brain uh, to a child early in life. Um, you know, what can we do as a society, as a world, to make it more peaceful and more civilized? And, um, you know, we talk about the incident, which you talked about in, in an article, the Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School uh, incident mm -hmm. and Columbine and all the others. And we talk about gun, gun control, but you basically say that we need to go really look at the individual and the impact, the trauma that the individual that um, was responsible for those actions had. So what can we learn from them as a society and uh, help uh, those, those individuals so that we can pre prevent those types of things from happening again? It's a great question, John. Uh, the, the reality is that you can take gun. I, I'm all for gun control. I'm very active on gun control here in Oregon and nationally. So, but but the reality is that you can take away the weapons or make them impossible to get a hold of. Uh, you can even expand mental health for adolescents, which is also crucial. Both of those things are crucial. 
But as long as we have a fair percentage of brand new little nervous systems, brand new little brains that are exposed to chronic trauma early, you're going to have adolescents who lack empathy, who lack impulse control, and lack the capacity for emotional self-regulation, the ability to calm, self-soothe in the face of stress. And, and very likely you're also going to see a reduction in cortical skills, the, the uh, uh, ability to problem solve and come up with nonviolent ways of dealing with strong negative emotion like rage and fear and anger, which is obviously the motivator behind the school shooting. So that combination, empathy, the capacity for emotional self-regulation, the capacity for problem-solving, complex problems, and uh, self-soothing, all of that is built into the little brain in this critical part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortical brain, early in life or not. And it's often overlooked in terms of the quality of nurture, even in middle-class and upper-class families. So we need as a society to recognize that the brain is really a drive, the driving force in human society and that, you know, we, we, understand, um, <laughs> we understand the importance of the quality of raw materials going into our, into our uh, serviceable goods. We understand the, the importance of the early construction process in the making of those goods. But we don't understand how critical it is with humanity to protect and love and nurture that little brain, particularly in the first three years of life, the nine months prenatally in the first two-plus years of life after birth. This is when those critical capacities develop. The, the brain of the caregiver shapes the brain of the baby by how they're handling them. And so if the caregiver is depressed or lacks impulse control and so on, all of that is imbued, is, is transferred to the baby. So if we ever really get that our job as a society, whether we're talking about reducing the impact of war or disease or the erosion of natural resources or overpopulation, all of the big issues that we're dealing with as a species are reliant upon little brains that are able to self-regulate, that are able to empathize, care, and the ability to problem-solve. And we're seeing less attention to that rather than more. When we talk about our schools and so forth, you know, our schools are being undermined by the lack of adequate nurture and, and work with the baby's brain before they ever hit school, before they ever hit preschool. It's very, very difficult to make up for this. And so if we ever get that our, that our brain is our most valuable resource and we begin to recognize how important it is to nurture that incredible resource from pre-birth and make sure that we get children off to a strong start, you'll see a straightening out in our schools. You'll see a lowering of juvenile justice problems. You'll see, you know, the, the capacity for our society <laughs> to grow in terms of workforce, I mean, we're just not getting it. The, everything, everything depends upon that little brain. You, you seem to be implying that the uh, some children's brains are already hardwired for violence or antisocial behavior or wired that way shortly after, after birth. If so, can this be discovered and modified during early childhood? Or if a child was traumatized toward those behaviors... Can it also be reversed? So basically, how, how do we deal it with it? On, yeah, it depends on the child. It depends on the, on the family. I mean, I'm a family therapist because I recognize that treating children a la carte from families, I mean, I, can, I tell parents I can see, yes, I'll see your child. I can see them once a week from today when he's four till the time that he graduates from high school. But I can have one tiny, tiny percentage of influence compared to the influence you will have if I'm able to work with you to be the therapist with him or her. Uh, so that's the, that's the effort. It's to change the milieu and to do it, get the parents involved or change the setting early. 
Um, and, and it's not shortly after birth that the brain is hardwired. It's, I mean, <laughs> the, first of all, there's always potential for change in all human beings. And, and we've recognized now that there's actually neurogenesis even in elderly people. Um, when we, the Alzheimer's research has shown that actually we do make, we used to think we, we, were, we were born with all the brain cells we'd ever have, but actually we recognize that there is a tremendous proliferation in adolescence and in that even in older people that there is some amount of uh, brain, growth, brain cell growth. So it's not, um, you know, you don't, you don't give up on anyone. We just have to recognize that what happens in the first three years, let me, let me explain to you. A baby is born with 25% of his or her eventual adult brain weight. All of the research animals that we've done all the brain research on, like the uh, macaque monkey is born, comes in at birth with 65% of adult brain weight. Even And chimpanzees come in with brains at 45% of adult brain weight at birth. But the human baby, having started at birth with just 25% of their eventual adult, adult brain weight, by the end of the second year of life, has achieved 90% of his or her eventual adult brain weight. So it's a very, very formative time. And, of course, there's a great deal we can do with preschoolers or with little ones and with grade schoolers. But we have to work with the whole milieu. We have to have really talented people who nurture and love and work with the whole family. And it's expensive. So the bottom line is it's not getting done. And so uh, one of you asked earlier, what can we do? Uh, to change this equation, we can recognize that this starts in the beginning. And if we just could put in help and nurture and surround families prenatal through those early times, the first few years are very tough on marriages, they're very tough on families. If we decided that we were really going to build little brains or help families build and nurture little little brains from the beginning, I think we could do a great deal. Uh, toward reducing the problem in the beginning. And then we'd still, we'll still have problems. We'll still have kids that will need help, but we can slow down the incredible tide of children that are in that situation right now. And I think the accent also is on social and emotional uh, development because, That's right. you know, looking back at the these incidences of violence, um, the perpetrators of those um, many uh, often are fairly intelligent individuals. Um, yeah. So it's not so much... And for, their, and for middle-class families. Yes, so it's not their their intellectual capability. Uh, we, we're finding right. that they're actually very smart individuals, but it's the social-emotional component that is sadly, severely lacking. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, and a really good point. Uh, you know, for want of a scientific term... The reality is that love counts, especially early in life. Tremendous, tremendous amount that has to happen early in life. And it is. It's emotional. And we have a program now where working, the Parenting Institute is working in Memphis to try to uh, establish that understanding. There's a huge PR campaign trying to educate the public about the importance of early emotional programming what we can do with love, what we can do with nurturing. And that isn't just about the parents, it's about the practitioners. You know, approaching people in a very different way, rather than what's wrong with you, what happened to you? What kinds of things have shaped the fact that you now really believe that the only way to handle Johnny is to smack him? Uh, let's talk about that, and let's talk about the impact of your life and, and, and what, what's happened with you and what we could do to prevent that from from shaping Johnny's life and, and how we can help you. It's a very different approach that we need to take, not just parents need to take, but we in the profession of emotional and mental health need to take with supporting and nurturing and seeing the strength in families and using that to surround whatever problems they're, they're tripping over. How can a, uh, a member of the family, a grandfather, uh, an aunt, an uncle, or even a friend of the family uh, identify perhaps a child that has been traumatized as an infant uh, by, you know, certain behaviors or whatever, and 
What should they do then to begin the process of helping that child? I imagine the first step is to go to the parent. But, of course, if the parent is part of the problem, that presents uh, another problem. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that um, it's, it's not an easy question because it depends so much on the family and on the, and on the child's personality. But overall, if you see a lack of empathy, if you see a lack of eye contact, if you don't feel like you're connecting with a child, that's a real danger sign. It may be that it's, that it's simply Asperger's, which is not a simple thing really, but it, it may be due to a brain-based difference that can be corrected uh, with work early on. Uh, but if it's that the child is simply not hooked in emotionally with anybody, um, you'll see a lot of attention getting, negative attention getting, real joy in being uh, a stinker, you know, doing the opposite of what is asked. If you see chronic noncompliance and parents that are just desperately trying to play catch-up with a child's behaviors, those are obvious warning signs early. But, you know, uh, if it's a grandparent, oftentimes grandparents are in a, in a place in their life where they're really looking, observing um, connections. And if a child is uh, not feeling like they're tuned in, the grandma and grandpa, not responsive to uh, interactions that grandparents uh, attempt, like reading or cuddling or talking or explaining, um, it's a good thing to look a little more deeply at what might be going on for the child. If a child is acting out sexually early, masturbating or uh, otherwise drawing attention to their body, that's often the sign of early abuse, early sexual abuse. Um, if a child is chronically withdrawn, definitely a sign that and it may just be a shy temperament child that may go it, nothing to worry about. But if a child is chronically withdrawn to the point of not interacting with other kids or not, you know, not being comfortable uh, at school, that those are things to look at. And again, it, <laughs> the therapist, the best therapists are the family themselves. So working to give them the skills early rather than waiting for that to manifest in a bigger problem in adolescence is so critical. Well, we, we, we preach that a lot in our, our, our Northwest Regional Key in, in terms of family engagement, and uh, it's such a big part of our focus. Robin, the time has uh, sped up so quickly, um, but it's a fascinating discussion uh, with, with this, and it's obviously a, a topic that we all have to um, continue to work towards uh, resolving. And uh, I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing Absolutely. as a family therapist and the Parenting <laughs> Institute so much. And uh, we will continue to follow you. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on the program again. So I That would be great. I, I, really, I, I really admire what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And that's our program for today. We'll be back in two weeks at this same time. In the meantime, you can go online to learn more at papromiseforchildren.com. For John Poza and the Northwest Regional Key Program for Quality Early Learning, I'm Joe Taylor. Thank you for listening and have a great day.